Alrighty boys, it is finally time for the long-awaited AP Bio Unit 7. I know, it's crazy. And I know I say that every time I have a video that I haven't done for a while, but this one's actually been long-awaited, dude. You guys keep commenting, you guys want AP Bio Unit 7 and 8, you guys want like AP Chem Unit 8 and 9. Don't worry, I'm gonna get to it, okay? Olympiad season, the first round at least, is done, so we're chilling. Hello everybody, I'm Karara, and today we are gonna be doing Unit 7, Natural Selection, and it will be fun. This one's actually a really long unit, so hopefully we get through it in some short amount of time, but we shall see. Alright, let's get the party started, shall we? Okay, so the big idea in this unit is really just evolution, okay? Everything in this unit is about evolution, and the one thing you gotta understand about evolution is that, is that it's a change, right? Now, in the context of biology, obviously we're not talking about the change where it's like Pokemon's like converting into Pikachu or something. I don't know how, how the evolution in Pokemon works, don't, don't ask me. But in biology, it's really just change in your characteristics, right? And obviously, as you guys know from Mendelian inheritance, like, your traits are encoded by allele. So, at the bare bones definition, though, like, the most low-level definition you can have of evolution is that it's a change in allele frequency or a change in your genetic code. Okay, hooray. We have finally finished the unit. Hooray, we are done. Let's go. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, we still gotta talk about all the nonsense that causes evolution, but basically the idea is if an, uh, a trait becomes more common in a population, right? Like, let's say brown hair. Like, brown hair gets all the girls, right? So, like, the brown-haired guys are going to have more success and, like, brown hair will increase in the population, right? So that's an example of evolution because the allele frequency of brown hair is increasing. So that brings us to the next point, okay? <laughs> Very nice segue. Natural selection. So a lot of people think that like natural selection and evolution are the exact same thing. They're not, okay? Like natural selection is what causes evolution, right? Evolution, all evolution is, is a change in allele frequency, okay? Natural selection is what actually causes it. Now basically the way I like to think about natural selection is like in terms of domestication, right? Like if you're breeding dogs, right? And let's say you want dogs with white colored hair. The breeder is basically going to have a ton of dogs and you're going to take the one with the most white hair, right? And eventually, if you only let the ones with white hair breed, you're only going to have dogs with white hair, right? So essentially Darwin, when he went on his like trip all over the globe <laughs> in the HMS Beagle, he basically was like, oh, what happens if nature did it in exactly the same way? And it tur turns out that it does. It's crazy. So essentially, like, let's look at bacteria. I think that's my favorite example of it. So we have a bunch of epic bacteria. And they are all chilling, doing totally fine stuff, right? And essentially, when an antibiotic comes around, right? Antibiotics are supposed to kill bacteria. It goes in and slaps all these guys, kills some of them. Epic, very cool. But let's just say, let's just say, that my boy Bob over here was a special kind of bacteria, okay? He had a slight difference from all his other friends, and he was slightly more resistant to this antibiotic than all his friends, right? So essentially, all of his friends are going to die out, right? And now Bob is going to reproduce, right? And now the bacteria is purely resistant to the antibiotic, right? It went from one single guy resistant to the antibody to everybody is resistant to the antibody, right? So this is clearly evolution, right? Like the allele frequency of resistance is increasing. Now obviously it doesn't have to be this intense, right? It might just be like some people have a slightly higher chance of surviving, right? So basically the common example is moths, right? So you have like the gray moths and you have white moths which I'll just do a very light gray, because white on white is not going to be very cool. And essentially, the white moths were doing super, super good at some point, right? Because all the trees, the bark was white, okay? So obviously, if the bark is white, you're more likely to survive if you have a lighter color, right? So all the gray moths kept dying, and they did have babies, so the proportion of white moths increased, right? So it makes sense. So this is the color of the tree trunks. The white moths were pretty good at hiding on that, right? But then this one factory went haywire, right? And it turned all the tree trunks gray because of like ash or something. I don't know the exact details of suit and all that good stuff. And essentially now, what do you think is going to happen? I wonder. This is a very, very complicated thing. But basically, all the white moths disappeared. It's crazy. And the reason is basically the exact same as the breeder, right? When the breeder chose only white dogs to reproduce, then only white dogs are going to be left after like a couple of generations, right? So in this case, nature in having this different colored tree trunks is selecting or giving these guys a higher chance of reproducing. So essentially these guys are gonna like produce less offspring so their numbers are gonna go down and these guys are gonna produce more offspring so their numbers are gonna go up. So that is the fundamental idea behind natural selection, right? Like nature is choosing which animals are more likely to survive and those animals that are more likely to survive are gonna increase in frequency and that is evolution. Now the one thing about natural selection is that it's completely random, right? You first need that one guy to be resistant to the antibiotic for it to spread to the whole population, right? Like if all of the bacteria were not resistant to the antibody, all of them would die out and boom, there's no evolution happening. So essentially natural selection requires variation in order to cause all this stuff, right? You need somebody to be different in order for him to like survive better than everybody else. So that gives a very important point, right? Natural selection needs variation. If everybody had black hair, all the brown haired guys would never like take over the world. You see what I'm saying? And basically this variation comes up in a bunch of ways, right? Like obviously there's sexual reproduction, right? Like 
your kids are similar to yourself, but they're slightly different, right? So they might survive better or worse than their peers, right? It also just comes up from mutations, right? Like your DNA just might randomly change and by some like total random chance, it might actually be helpful and that like mutation might become more common because it's so helpful. And then of course there's like horizontal gene transfer between like um, bacteria and stuff, but that's not as important. Just know like sexual reproduction and mutation are the main ways that variation is produced. All right, so those are the basics of natural selection. The main thing you gotta remember is first that like natural selection means that some people survive better than others and are more likely to reproduce, right? Survival of the fit. Second idea is that you pass on your genes to your kids, right? So if you have the genes that are making you more likely to survive, your kids are also gonna have those genes. So that means that your genes, if you're more likely to survive, are gonna spread throughout the whole population. And then third, natural selection requires variation, right? Because if everybody's the same, then like, nobody is more likely to survive than everybody else. Okay, so natural selection is only one of the things that cause evolution. It's the main thing, but it's not the only thing. And of course, bio has a bunch of fancy terms for the rest of them, so let us get into the other stuff. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is genetic drift, right? And like, whenever you hear this, drift, just think of random, right? Like drift is random, you're not actually controlling where you're going, it's completely random. So genetic drift just means random chance changes in the allele frequency, right? Like let's just say that you have only two people in a population, right? Only two people exist in the whole universe, okay? And one has like a dominant allele and a recessive allele, and one of them has two dominant alleles, right? So essentially, if you just draw the Punnett square, right, there is a half chance your kid is HH and a half chance that they're double big H, right? So let's just say by chance, right? These two guys have like two kids that are both HH, right? Just by chance, like this is completely random. Just by chance, the H allele is completely gone. It used to have a 25% chance, now it's just completely gone. This is so sad. What did the little H allele do wrong? With, why, why you gotta do this to him? But basically the point is, random changes can cause a lot of change in your allele frequency and that's what's called genetic drift. Now the only other thing you should keep in mind when you're thinking about genetic drift is that you need like very few people in order to, for genetic drift to occur, right? Like, for example, in our example, we only had two people, right? Like, obviously chance is probably gonna play a role in it. So you need a small, small population. Like basically the way I like to think of it is like, let's say you're trying to figure out whether a dice is weight, right? So you roll it once and you get a one. You're not all of a sudden gonna be like, oh shoot, that dice is unfair. I got a one 100% of the time, right? Like just because you rolled it very few number of times, there is a very, very good possibility that like one roll, like one number takes over the whole thing, right? But if you roll that dice like a million times and every single time it's a one, you probably should have like looked at the dice and actually see that all the faces are one, right? But the point is, as you have like average over a ton of stuff, then there's very little likelihood that your allele frequency is gonna change much due to random chance, right? But if you only do one roll, there's a very good likelihood that it's gonna change a lot. So remember that genetic drift ca is caused by small population size. So there are basically two types of genetic drift you have to know, right? There is the founder effect and the bottleneck effect, very cool. I gotta say, of all the biology things there are out there, the genetic drift one has the most descriptive names. Founder effect and bottleneck effect are exactly what they sound like. All right, founder effect, just, just take a guess. Take a guess what it might be. I have, I like have no idea. Oh, maybe it is when a couple guys found a new colony. Holy moly, I, I never would have thought of that. What the heck, that's crazy. So essentially like, let's say you have like a really, really, really big population, right? And, and, and they're basically like, all like relatively the same. Well, let's just say there's two different types of people in this population, right? And they're roughly equal. Now let's just say, by chance, just by chance, this like tiny subset of them get cut off from the rest of the population, right? Like may maybe like an earthquake happened and like, you know, that dinosaur movie where like the two have, I don't even remember the name of that anymore. What was it called? You know, I need to find this the little dinosaur movie. Is that what I'm gonna search? No, that's not what it is. What? <laughs> uh, little dinosaur animated series? Oh, this one, yes. Land Before Time. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what it was. Oh my God, I watched this one so much. Holy moly. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I got distracted there. But the point is, this tiny little segment of the population got cut out. So in the whole population, there's 50% of the red guys, right? But now, in this new population, they got separated from everyone else. They go and found a new population. And in this new population, there's 75% red people, right? We basically went from 50% of the people being red to 75% of them being red, right? So it's kind of crazy. Just because we took a tiny little portion of the population, we completely changed the allele frequency. That is what the founder effect is when a couple guys found a new colony and just due to chance because there's such a small founding population, it results in a very big change in allele frequency. Okay, now the bottleneck effect is also pretty self-explanatory. So essentially it's if you take a very big population, right, let's just copy this over actually, I'm lazy. <laughs> Who needs to draw another second time, you know what I'm saying? So basically the bottleneck effect is like the exact same thing as the founder effect, except it's a little bit more gruesome. Basically all of these guys just die, right? <laughs> uh, I shouldn't be laughing at that, but you know what I'm saying? You guys just die, okay? 
And essentially, these are the only guys who are left, and for the same reason as the founder effect, the allele frequency changes a lot, right? So there you go, the two types of genetic drift. It's like a bottleneck, right? Like you take a really big population, you squeeze them through the bottleneck, and only a couple guys get pooped out. You guys probably do not need the imagery, but it helps you me remember, okay? All right, and then the next one is gene flow, right? This also could cause evolution if a bunch of people with a certain phenotype come into your population, right? Like if you have like a bunch of only like non-red guys, right? And then you bring the red guys in from another population, right? Like a couple guys move in, obviously your allele frequency is gonna change. All right, gene flow, pretty self-explanatory. Gene is flowing from one population to another. All right, now for the infamous Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. I love this stuff. Oh my God, no I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I hate this stuff, but it's okay. Basically all bio students know this like equilibrium as the most math you're gonna have to do in a bio class. It's, it's great, I love math. <laughs> I mean, it's good for me. I don't know about you guys, but but it's math, okay? You gotta know quite a bit of math to do this. So basically the idea behind hardy weinberg equilibrium is like allele frequencies, right? Like we keep talking about this allele frequency thing. I've been pretty vague about it, right? I've just said like it's how like frequent a trait is, but what an allele frequency actually is, is the number of a certain allele over the total number of alleles in the whole population. So let's say you have a population of like, I don't know, let's say 100 um, HH, 100 HH and a hundred like little h little h, right? Then the way you find the allele frequencies is you find how many of each allele there are, right? So let's just say we're trying to find the dominant allele, right? These guys have two of the dominant allele, right? So there's 200 from the first guys, then each of these guys have only one, so there's plus 100 from these guys, right? And then these guys have no, none of the big one, right? And then we divide by the total number. So if you have 300 guys, each of them have two, how much is that? That's right, a total of 300. So your allele frequency is just 0.5, okay. And then obviously, if you have one allele is 0.5, the rest of them have to be the other allele, so they should also be one minus 0.5, which is equal to 0.5. All right, so that's basically the concept of allele frequency. Now let's just get into Hardy-Weinberg. So I think like teachers don't really like talk about this too much, but the whole point of Hardy-Weinberg is just probability, right? It basically, if you know that your population is like 0.5 of one allele and 0.5 of the other, how likely is it that you get like two of the same allele. That is right, the likelihood of that. I mean, you know, I should probably like change up the numbers so that it's only not the same thing and it's less confusing. Let's just say it's 0 0.6 and 0 0.4, right? This is h and this is little h. Then what's the probability of getting two h's, right? So using the rule of the probability, if you want to get the same thing, like at the same time, you basically ought to multiply it together, right? So the probability of getting your first h is 0 0.6 and the probability of getting your second h is 0 0.6, which basically means that 36% of the population should have the big h allele, right? Should be like homozygous dominant. Then what about if you wanted two of the little h's, right? Then it's just 0.4 times 0.4 is equal to 0 0.16 gives you h h, right? And then what about if you wanted to get big H and little H? Then essentially you can either get your like little H from your mom or you can get it from your pop, right? So essentially there's two ways to order like which side you get each of them from, right? You could either get big H from your dad, little H from your mom, or little H from your dad, big H from your mom. And then you have to multiply like the probability of each, right? So the probability your dad has it is 0.6 and the probability your mom has the other one is 0.4 and vice versa, that's why you multiply by two. And this is just gonna be 0.48. Now, the one thing you should do, whenever you want to like check if you're right, just make sure that all of these things add up to one, right? And you want to make sure that these two things add up to one, right? All right, so why don't we just do like a couple of typical problems, right? Like this is obviously one example, right? You are given the allele frequency, then you want to find the frequency of each genotype, right? But there's also, you're given the genotype and you want to find each of the two um, frequencies, right? All right, so let's just say you're given a thousand dudes. Dudes with two O's, very cool. And, and let's just say we have like, um, well, what's a good allele? Let's say, let's just do the hair thing again because I love hair. <laughs> like double H or like H codes for black hair and little H codes for brown hair. So let's just say that like um, of these guys, only 40 have brown hair and the rest of them, the 960 other guys have black hair, right? Now I know that this is not very consistent with the fact that brown hair people are objectively more attractive, but let's just do this for the sake of argument, right? You know what I'm saying? So essentially, like whenever you approach Hardy-Weinberg problems, just ignore the dominant allele, right? Because the dominant allele, like these guys, could either be big H, big H, or big H, little H. You don't know anything, they're like lame. Why would you even care about these guys? They have multiple alleles, what the heck? Imagine having multiple alleles, that's crazy. But these guys, there's only one possible thing that the brown haired dudes could be, and that's HH, right? So what is the frequency of HH dudes? That's 0 
four, right? 40 over 1,000. And how did we find the percentage of guys who have little h, little h? We took the frequency of h and multiplied it by itself, right? Because the probability you get an h the first time is the pro like the percent of h, and the percent you get it the second time is the same thing, right? So essentially, you could say q squared is equal to that, right? And then you just take the square root, you get q is equal to 0 0.2, and you gotta know how to subtract from one. So that means that p is equal to 0 0.8. Very cool. And if you just want to check whether like you get like 0.96 remaining, okay, so let's just do it out, right? So um, the percent of big H, big H is a 0 0.8 uh, times 0 0.8, which is equal to 0.64. And then the percentage of these guys is just two times 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 is equal to 0 0.32 add these guys together and you get 0 0.96 as desired, very cool. So obviously that's like the practical application of Hardy-Weinberg, but basically at a high level, what Hardy-Weinberg is saying is that like, if you just think about it as in terms of probability, right, the allele frequency is gonna stay constant and the frequency of each type of offspring is gonna stay constant as well. However, Hardy-Weinberg does not occur that often in nature because it needs five very specific conditions, okay? And we already talked about a lot of these, right? <laughs> essentially, essentially, you could just think of Hardy-Weinberg as being purely like not due to chance, right? Like everything is like determined by the laws of probability. So as we talked about before, that means you need big numbers. If you have small numbers, you have genetic drift and that is bad. You also can't have mutations, right? Because li literally the definition of equilibrium is that nothing is changing, right? Three, you can't have natural selection, right? Because if you had natural selection, the mating would not be completely random, right? Like some people are more likely to mate than others. So you can't have natural selection. Sorry, no mutation. No, with an exclamation part, point. Yeah, there we go. And no to natural selection. And then the fourth thing is no gene flow, right? We basically don't want any like causes of evolution. And of course, random mating because you don't want like people to specifically choose like all the good looking guys because like that obviously now there would be more than 40 brown haired people, right? <laughs> Dang, I don't know why I'm suddenly addicted to brown hair. I promise I'm not like this in real life, I think. Hopefully. So obviously like this looks a bit intimidating, but you don't have to actually remember it, okay? You just have to remember the big idea that Hardy-Weinberg is purely random. There can't be any form of evolution. Like Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium does everything stay the same. Everything follows the law of the probability. So that's all you gotta know. These things are pretty clear from that. So as long as you know that you should be good. Okay, nice. Now we are kind of done with the natural selection part kind of this. So now what we got to talk about is phylogeny. And that's basically the idea of the study of species, right? And like the relationship between each other. So before we were talking about microevolution, right? Like evolution in terms of like actual, like individual organisms mating with each other, right? But now we want to talk about macroevolution, which is basically like over time, like over millions of years, we went from dinosaurs to humans and clearly humans are superior. Oh, I don't know about that. Dinosaurs are pretty cool. But yeah, macroevolution is basically over a very, very long period of time how like lineages of animals have changed. So we kind of saw like from the idea of natural selection is that if you have one dude, right? Like this one guy, like let's just say it's one type of bacteria, right? And then eventually like, let's just say that one part of the bacteria was subjected to the antibodies. I mean, not, not antibodies, antibiotics. And one was not, then the, the one that was subjected to the antibody is gonna be completely different from the one that wasn't subjected to the antibody, right? And eventually they'll split from the original species, there'll be now two species. So then the idea is that like there's a common ancestor that splits up due to natural selection, and eventually you get a bunch of different species, right? Like you keep splitting, keep splitting, keep splitting, and you get like a ton of cool, very cool species. So basically what phylogeny studies is what are these common ancestors? Who did, who did each of us evolve from, right? Like for us, we share a common ancestor, a pretty like recent common ancestor with chimpanzees. That is why we are very closely related to them. So the main concept of phylogeny that we are gonna be talking about is speciation. I wonder what that means. Yeah, it means making new species. And like, obviously that is caused by natural selection. Ah, no, <laughs> bro. But we still gotta talk about what specifically causes speciation because it is a little bit more complicated than that. So the first thing you gotta know is what is a species? A species is just defined as like people who can like interbreed and have viable offspring, right? Like the offspring could also reproduce and they could also live properly. Okay, so this is called the biological species concept. There are other species concepts, but this is the most legit one. Just remember the biological species concept is in terms of whether they can breed with each other or not. Right, like the like a very common example is like horse and donkey, right? Horse plus donkey equals mule. 
very quick math. Now, the reason why horses and donkeys are separate animals, even though they could have offspring together, is because the mules actually can't have any kids. So their offspring are not viable, so technically horses and donkey are not the same species. And basically there's two ways that speciation can occur. There's allopatric, right? Uh, I think this is the first thing that I thought was very cool in bio. I was like, wow, allopatric speciation is such a cool word. Dude, I literally, <laughs> dude, I literally, I literally spewed allopatric speciation everywhere. My protobol username was allopatric speciation. My, like, I don't know. I, I just used allopatric speciation everywhere. It was a very cool word, not gonna lie. And then there is sympatric, which is not quite as cool, but it, it's decent. It's decent, I'll give it that. But basically, this just refers in where the species form, right? So allopatric means they are geographically split apart, right? The land, the land before time kind of thing. <laughs> but sympatric basically means they're still in the same place, but they still form different species. Like allopatric speciation is pretty obvious how it like happens, right? Like uh, obviously like one population gets stuck over here, one population gets stuck over here, and maybe like the guys over here find a new food source because they're in a completely different place, right? And then they're gonna get naturally selected to uh, get adaptations for that food source, and then their friends back home are gonna like face completely different pressures, and they're just gonna like have completely different adaptations. And then eventually you have new species, very cool. Like I think there's a ton of good examples, like any island is a very good example of allopatric speciation, right? Like Madagascar, you have lemurs which are found nowhere else in the world and lemurs are very cool, you should search them up. But the point is like, obviously lemurs are completely different from everywhere else because they got separated from everybody else, like geographically, and now they like evolved completely differently. Then Australia, bro, why can I not keep my pencil in my hand today? Ugh. And as I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted by my pencil, is that. <laughs> right, I forgot. No, no. So Australia, so basically Australia is also a very good example too, right? Because literally, there's the, that's like the one place where there's only marsupials, right? Like literally every single thing, like all the carnivores, the fossa is an example of a carnivore, the like kangaroos, the herbivores, they're also marsupials. Everybody's a marsupial just because they were in a completely different environment from everywhere else. They didn't mix with all the eutherians or like the non-marsupials. So when you think about allopatric species, just think about islands, okay? geographic split. And then as you might imagine, if allo means like apart, then sim, like sim is like the same thing, right? So they're in the same place, sympatric. Now like sympatric speciation, like how it occurs is not very like fun. And uh, like honestly, it, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, the one thing you could think about is like polyploidy. I think that's the only example that the book gives. But basically all that means is that you have an error in meiosis, you got like extra chromosomes and then you create a new species. You don't have to actually worry about the exact specifics of that. Okay, now, Another thing that causes speciation, those are the two types of like geographic things, but there's actual things that cause the species to form, right? Like the only way you could have species form is if they can't reproduce with each other. So the like one criteria for species to be considered separate is reproductive isolation. So if you have to remember one thing about speciation is that they have to be reproductively isolated, okay? And that's like the one definition of species, right? So essentially reproductive isolation can occur in several ways, right? Like either you could stop them from reproducing in the first place or once they reproduce, you could just kill their kid, right? Okay, that was, <laughs> that was kind of cool. But the idea is like they're, if, even if they do breed, their kid is not gonna be like viable. So stopping them from breeding in the first place is called postzygotic, right? Like zygote is your kid, right? So obviously if you stop them before, it's prezygotic. Oh, did I say postzygotic? No, it's prezygotic, before the zygote. And then if you do it after, if your kid is like not viable, then it's postzygotic because the zygote was already formed. Okay, so prezygotic is like a bunch of different examples. They don't really matter, honestly speaking, but like I'll just go through the uh, five types. So habitat, right? Like they live in different habitats, temporal. They have like uh, mate at different times, right? So if they mate at different times, they can't mate together because like obviously you can't like time travel, you know what I'm saying? Then there's mechanical, which basically means that their parts don't fit together, which is kind of nasty, but <laughs> the example that the book is is the snails, right? Their, their shells curl in different directions, so they can't actually mate. Then there is gametic isolation. So basically, even if like the gametes come together, they won't actually fuse because there's some like different like physiological thing. Like with corals, they literally just throw their sperm out there. It's kind of crazy. But literally like the sperm that they release could only fertilize like eggs from the same species. So that's an example of gametic isolation. And then of course there's behavioral, right? Like um, different animals have different courtship behavior. Then if you can't perform the courtship behavior, none of the other species is gonna choose you as a mate, right? So that's another example. So then we like postzygotic is obviously your kid is not viable. So the one way that reduced hybrid viability, right? That's literally what I just said. So that means that like your like offspring is literally like, it can't even live past a certain age. It just dies off really quickly. Another one is reduced hybrid like fertility, right? So it can't have kids of its own. And of course, hybrid breakdown. That just means that like eventually, like even if the kids of the kids can't have kids, 
events we like the genetic like damage or like whatever caused the hybrid it just doesn't work out and eventually at some point it dies out hybrid breakdown okay very cool you do not have to know any of this no i'm kidding you probably should like have an idea that it exists, but like you don't have to like memorize every single one of these and what they do. Just remember the high level prezygotic and postzygotic, and you should be chilling. Okay, so essentially from what we've done already, we've seen that like one species splits into two, right? So that basically gives us the idea of common ancestry. So let's talk about that now. So essentially, scientists want to figure out which animals have are like more like have a common ancestor with which other animals, right? So like we obviously know that chimps and humans are pretty related because they have a very recent common ancestor, right? Which basically means they had less time to have differences, right? Because there used to be literally one species just like a couple years, like that, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and then suddenly they diverged, right? So essentially relatedness is basically proportional to how recent your common ancestor is. So the more recent your common ancestor, the more related you are. Now, now, how do we actually figure out whether people are related, right? Now, you, you might just say, like, look, and if they look the same, right? Like, humans have hands, chimps have hands. Like, obviously, they should be similar. They should be pretty related. And yeah, that's exactly what scientists do. There's no, like, fancy, well, there is fancy, like, molecular stuff, but at a high level, they literally just look at them and say, okay, what features did they have in common? And these features are called homologous features. I wonder why. Homo, same, homologous, you know what I'm saying? It makes sense. And basically, these are just the features that are the exact same due to common ancestry. Like, the reason that whales, flippers, have the same bones as human hands is because we both, like, evolved from the same common ancestor and we have the same bones. That's because we derive from the same common ancestor. The reason why bats have the same finger-like bones in their wings is because we have a common ancestor. So, the wings and the hands are homologous structures. Then, of course, there is vestigial structures, right? Like, like for humans, an example is our tailbone, which we do not use for anything other than getting roasted when you accidentally fall on our butt talks. But, <laughs> let's not talk about that. But the reason we have it is because our primate ancestors, like monkeys, they had tails, right? So essentially for us, we didn't need it anymore, so eventually it got reduced down to just your tailbone. So basically we have it due to common ancestry, but it's, we don't use it anymore. And then the last one that you have to know are analogous structures, right? So, like... In an analogy, it's not the exact same thing. Like me analogizing genetic drift to uh, rolling a dice, is, they're not the same thing, right? But they both get across the same point. So in the same idea, these structures are not like, they don't come from the same idea, like they don't come from the same thing, but they both serve the same purpose. Like take for example, bird wings and insect wings, right? Like obviously insects do not have bones. If you thought they had bones, that would be very sad. But like birds do have bones in their wings. So even though both the wings are used to fly, they're not like from the same idea. They're not like the same thing, exactly. So essentially, um, uh, same function. And these are caused by the same like selection pressures, right? Like both of them needed to fly. So they both found different ways to fly, but not common ancestor. Not, not due to common ancestry. All right, so just know these and you should be good. I think homologous and analogous are pretty easy to remember. Then this digital is just the one that's left over, which is just like what our tailbone is. Wait, this is so big brain. Easy. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that, you, you guys have got this, okay? And then other than anatomy, you can also find it out using molecular bio, right? Like Alex said, like if two things have a more recent common ancestor, their genetic codes are going to be more similar, right? Because they have less time to diverge, right? Another way you could determine the difference is biogeography, right? Like, like obviously, if a island separates before animals have a chance to um, differentiate, like all the marsupials on Australia are likely more related to each other than they are to all the other animals in other places of the world. And then, of course, you could look at fossils, right? Like, um, basically, in your fossils, like they're they're in these layers called strata. Like, strata literally means layers, and you can see how old each fossil is based on where it is, because it gets buried over time. So obviously older fossils are going to be more buried, but basically you can see as you go from bottom to top, the slow gradation and like how, how species have changed over time and that would give you a certain like idea of who's related to who, right? Okay, and now the last thing we got to talk about phylogenetics is phylogenetic trees, okay, and how to read that. So I mean, it's pretty easy. I mean, I, I don't know, there's not too much to say about it, but let's just say we have like this very, 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 very fancy phylogenetic tree. And it basically asks you like, let's just say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, okay? And ask you who's more related, E and H or A and E? And basically, you could look at common ancestry. You just go up here, you go up here, and then you go there. And you can see that both of these meet first time. Like, as you go to the top, they meet for the first time here, right? So this is their most recent common ancestor. Okay, let's look at A and H, right? Alrighty. So their common ancestor is all the way up here, which means that their common ancestor is longer away, or sorry, A and E, right, that same thing, but it's farther, like, it's farther in the past. So essentially, E and H are more related than E and A. 
even though like E and A are pretty close together in terms of alphabet, but like just just here, like you can see that their common ancestor is more recent. I guess the other thing to mention about phylogenetic trees is that like essentially if something evolves here, right, then all of these guys should probably have that trait, right? Like let's just say that this is this these whole guys are all like mammals, right? Then this should be live birth, right? So all the guys over here should not give birth to live young. All the guys here should probably give birth to live young. Now obviously it's possible that somebody might have evolved to not do live birth anymore, but the idea is that most of the guys in this area should have live birth. And then basically, like, if something evolved here, all of these guys should have it, right? And something evolved here, all of these guys should have it because this line is a common ancestor of both of these guys. Very cool. All right, we're almost at the end. This is such a long unit, but we're getting there, okay? Mass extinctions. Okay, these ones are pretty self-explanatory. You really don't even need to know that much about them, honestly speaking, but it's really just a mass extinction. Like, a ton of the species on Earth get destroyed. So the three, like there's five biggest ones, like five like actual mass extinctions that ever occurred, but there's like three main ones, right? There's Permian-Triassic. So this is basically right before the dinosaurs came. Then there is the KT, like Cretaceous Tertiary, I don't know why why they spell it with a K, but it seems cool. And this is basically when all the dinosaurs died out, when a meteor struck and it like caused like a bunch of debris and they couldn't get sunlight for their plants and they all died out. So that is what caused dinosaurs to die. And I think those are actually the two main ones, but like there's obviously like one that's supposedly happening right now, right? Okay, honestly, not much else to say about it. Basically, just when some really bad disturbance happens, right? Like I think the Permian Triassic was caused by like oxygenation. No, no, one one of the mass extinctions was caused by oxygenation, and a bunch of people who can't survive with oxygen like started dying out. Then obviously, Cretaceous Tertiary was caused by a big meteor. <laughs> like that, that's as big of a disturbance as you get. And now right now it's human, right? We're like completely changing the environment. Okay, and now for the final section of this unit, we have the origin of life. So let us start talking about history because I know all the guys who like science also like history. That is how it works. It's totally not inversely proportional, but we're gonna talk about the origin of the earth. So let me take you back 4.6 billion years ago to the start of the earth. Well, I mean, the book says 4.5, I don't know. It's about 4.6 or 4.5, I don't know the exact date. Earth was born. Then essentially like Earth was like really really hot when it first formed, right? Like it really molten and it keeps getting bombarded by meteors. So eventually at like 3.9 billion years ago or something, it started cooling down enough for like water to start actually condensing on the surface so you can actually have oceans. And then around 3.5 billion years ago, like some, some point between like oceans forming and 3.5 billion years ago, life formed. And the reason we know this is because we found some epic fossils called stromatolites, which are basically like these like layered rocks. <laughs> they, they look pretty cool. They're like this, and then there's like a ton of layers in them. And each of the layers is like a bunch of bacteria. So essentially stromatolites are just bacteria fossilized. And how did we get from oceans forming to like stromatolites? Basically, people think that the first life to form was self-replicating RNA. And essentially the reason why that is is because RNA is like much more versatile than DNA. It can literally, it, it literally acts as an enzyme sometimes, it's called a ribozyme. But basically that's called the RNA world hypothesis, where RNA is the first, um, first life form. But then how did RNA form in the first place? What the heck? That's crazy. Well basically what scientists think, they don't actually know, but like what they think is that it went from inorganic substances, they eventually got like, they reacted together to form building blocks of bigger molecules, right? Like amino acids, like singular nucleic acids, like monosaccharides, that stuff. And then eventually those building blocks came together to form polymers like RNA. And then of course, like organic stuff might've also come from meteorites. That's also an option because even the meteorites that hit earth today, they also come with like a couple organic compounds. All right, so you don't need to know too much of this, right? But like the one thing you gotta know about the origin of the, the one thing is the Miller-Urey experiment. It has a very catchy name, so I don't think you're gonna forget it anytime soon, okay? Miller-Urey, that, that's the coolest name you could ever ask for. But basically all they did, is they just took like a bunch of gas, they just like slapped in a bunch of gas into a container, they sparked it up, very cool, and they turned inorganic into organic, just using like a couple gases and an electric spark. So essentially this suggested that like organic compounds could have actually formed from these inorganic ones to produce life. <laughs> like literally this is all you gotta know, like, Basically, they found that this experiment was not actually accurate to Earth's initial atmosphere, but like since then they've done a bunch more experiments and they've shown that it's still possible even in Earth's initial um, like atmosphere, you still could produce organic substances from inorganic substances. Now, now obviously this is like the most dumbed down explanation of Miller-Urey, if you want to search it up, go ahead, but the main thing you have to like, know is that they just mixed a bunch of gases, they sparked it, and it produced organic molecules from inorganic ones. All right, we finally made it. This is crazy. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. But like, 
that was a pretty big unit. Uh, like if I, I might have like explained stuff badly or something, but let me know in the comments how I did. And other than that, that's all I got for you guys today. So thank you guys for watching again, and see you guys next time.